Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are finishing up our fourth episode in a series of marriage record episodes. And we've been talking for the last two weeks about marriage records, how to find them, where to find them, um, what to do if they're not online. Today we are going to talk about clues you can find about a marriage in a non-marriage record. Um, the fact of the matter is, is some of your ancestors' marriages were just not recorded as a marriage record. Now, um, some of them were, many of them were, and so don't just jump straight to this, but this is one of those things that you can use as a strategy to either find the marriage um, information so that you can then go look again for the marriage record, or in case the marriage record doesn't exist, um, this is a way to document that particular marriage. So we have lots to cover today. Let's go ahead and dive right in. We're going to talk first about a kind of record that you are very familiar with, but maybe you haven't looked at it in quite this way. And so I'm going to give you some things you can do that will help you discover more specific clues about your ancestor's marriage through census records. First off, you're going to want to collect all of the census records for your ancestors' lifespan, particularly the lifespan um, after they were an adult. Now, of course, you're gonna want those records when they were a child as well, but um, particularly after they're adult, an adult and they're living with their spouse and their children, um, and there are a few things you need to know or pay attention to. From 1850 through 1900, so every census um, from 1850 to 1900, there is a little column that just has a checkbox. Uh, sometimes a month is written into that column. Sometimes the month column is just next to it. But the question on the census was, were you married within the year? So if your ancestor was, or if you're lucky enough to have an ancestor who was married um, uh, within a year before a census was taken, between 1850 and 1900, there will be a little check mark there in that column. Um, and so look for that on those particular censuses. In 1900 and 1910, the question that was asked was, the, year, the years you've been married in your present marriage. And so what you'll oftentimes see is a number, you know, 32, 64, 2, whatever. You'll see a little number just to um, the right of the uh, marital status column. It will almost always or should always be the same for both the husband and the wife, right? Um, if they're different, it means they just misunderstood the question or the question wasn't asked correctly. Um, maybe the question that was asked was, how many years have you been married? Um, and if that question was asked and one of them said, well, I was first married, you know, 60 years ago, and the other person said, well, I was first married 40 years ago, well, then the census taker would have written that down. And so look for discrepancies in that number, but there shouldn't be. Um, if the question was asked appropriately, it was the years of, of, uh, that you've been in your present marriage. And then every once in a while, you'll get really lucky, and the marital status column, where you usually see the M for married, will have a little number one or a number two, sometimes a number three next to it. And what that means is what marriage number they are on. So, you know, years of present marriage, 15, but the husband is an M2 and the wife is an M1, that means he, this is his second marriage and her first. So pay attention to that on those particular censuses. Those years are really critical just because um, this is about the time period, this 1900-1910 time period, is about the time period when most states started keeping marriage records. So you find a couple on here that's been married 40 or 50 years, it's, it's a pretty big deal because you're going to be able to document their marriage with that information. And remember, use the information in both censuses. Don't just take it one of them. You know, the teenage daughter may have been asked the question in 1900, and then the wife may have answered the census taker's questions in 1910. So sometimes you'll see discrepancies in census records, um, but that's to help you get close to that date. And then in the 1930 census, the question was refined a little bit, and the question asked was, what was your age when you first got married? 
um, or at your first marriage. And so again, um, you're going to have to do some math because this one is, is an age question, not a years question. But um, pay attention. If the husband is 50 and he was 20 at his first marriage and the wife is 50 and she was 30 at her first marriage, that may mean that this is not the first marriage for one or the other or both of them. And so pay attention to um, that. Do, do a little bit of math there to help figure that out. So those census records are going to give you some really, really big clues to when and even where your ancestor may have been married. And sometimes that is the only documentation you're going to find is in those particular records. Another way to use the census record um, has to do with paying attention to the children. And here's just three quick suggestions for how to do that. One is, and this, this again goes to that idea of making sure you have all the census records for a family, um, make sure you know who that oldest child is. Just because that oldest child isn't your ancestor doesn't make them insignificant. <laughs> Uh, or yeah, did I say that right? <laughs> anyway, um, they're important. They're important to the family story, but they're also important to helping you narrow in on when that marriage may have occurred. Also, where that marriage may have occurred. Um, I often have to create a timeline of birthplaces. You know, if you've got a child born in Tennessee and then the next child's born in Tennessee and then you've got three children born in Arkansas and then the last child's born in Oklahoma, well, you know, just because the family has lived in Oklahoma for 30 years doesn't mean that's where I'm going to find the marriage record. So pay attention to the birthplaces of those children and make sure that they're consistently documented over time because I may need to be looking in Tennessee for that marriage or whatever, right? So just that oldest child is going to be a big key to when that couple got married and based on where that child was born it gives me a clue of where to start looking even if both the parents were born in North Carolina if that oldest child was born in Tennessee now I've got two places to look for that particular marriage also and this is just more a word of caution but but it's important pay attention to gaps in the ages of the children when you look at a list of children in a household, um, if there is a, a gap, you know, like if they're having consistently having a child every two years, and then all of a sudden you have a four-year or a six-year gap, that could be indicative of a few things. One thing is they could have had ch children who died um, that you need to be looking for to fill in those gaps. But the other thing that is possible is that there is a mother that died in childbirth and then the father remarried. And so those older children may belong to a first wife and the younger children may belong to a second wife. And, and so that, you know, you may be looking for a marriage for a George Lawrence married to Sarah uh, based on the age of that oldest child, but Sarah may not be the mother of that oldest child. The mother of that oldest child may be a Mary. And that may be why you're not finding that record. So pay attention to those gaps in the ages of the children. Try to fill them in. Look for death records for any children or, or cemetery records or whatever for any children who may have died. And then if the gaps can't be explained by that, take, take into consideration the fact that the mother of the oldest children may have died and you may need to be looking for two marriage records for that gentleman, um, one earlier and one later. Also, of course, um, pay attention to surnames of children. Uh, it, just because there are children with a different surname living in a household, particularly before 1880 when that relationship to head of household was listed, um, pay attention to the names of those children. If some of those children in that household have a different name, it doesn't mean that they're cousins. It could mean that they are children of the mother from a first marriage. Also pay attention to the order in which children are listed. Even if the census taker just dittoed down the last name, one of the things that I have seen repeatedly is um, the, ch the biological children of that couple will be listed first, and then the stepchildren um, will be listed next, even if they're out of birth order. And so it's just another clue that maybe you might be looking for a previous marriage. Who knew? All of that was in census records. So if you're stuck, maybe you need to go back and just review some of those census records for some of this information. Now there are three other record types that I want to talk about in the last half of our time together today. Um, again, these are non-marriage records that will give you clues to where to go to find the marriage 
or provide you with evidence or documentation that a marriage occurred, even if a marriage record never was created or doesn't exist. So divorce records, uh, not, divorce is not a pleasant thing to think about, and it is not as uh, uncommon historically as we might have assumed originally. And some of these divorce records are available online, or at least the indexes are available online. So um, let's hop over here to the website. Here is the quickest way to find divorce records. If you just, let me get rid of my bookmarks bar. You guys don't need to see all of the things I have bookmarked. Okay, gives me a little more space to work with. Let's hover over search. We're going to zoom down here to the card catalog. Click on that. <clears throat> now you can filter um, over here, and you've seen me do that. Um, divorce records are actually included in with our marriage records collection, so you can use the filters. Or a faster way to do it is just right here in the title field. Just type in the word divorce, click search. We've only got about 27, 21 <laughs> databases that contain divorce records. Now you'll, you'll notice many of these are very current. Um, divorce records are considered public record. Um, they're a court or they're, they're a they're a legal record, um, and so they're not considered a vital record technically, and so there are privacy laws surrounding them like there are many other things. And so one of the things that you'll discover in some of these divorce records, like Texas divorces, for example, not only does it record the divorce date, it records the marriage date and the number of children that were born to that union. So, And that's in the index. That's, you know, you still should probably order the original court case, but you can find some of that information in the index. However, if you look here, you're going to see, for example, UK, let me make that a little bit bigger, UK civil divorce records, these go back to 1858. So if your ancestor or relative was living in England, those divorce records, um, the index there is available. Now, one of the databases that I want to take a look here is the main divorce records. You'll notice this says this database starts in 1798. And so that's excellent, right? I mean, that we have records that go back that far in some of these locations. Now, um, somebody had, Maine has excellent marriage records that go back very far. And somebody had asked me about they how they couldn't find a marriage record for this particular person. And sure enough, I double searched the main marriage records database, could not find a marriage record for this person. However, what we did discover is a divorce record. And there are a couple of things that are really excellent about this particular record. Remember, this is just an index. There's no image over here for me to click on. But um, here is a defendant, Stephen Kinney, or Stephen McKinney, and the plaintiff, meaning the person who instigated the divorce, is the spouse, Elmira McKinney. In parentheses underneath, it lists um, Elmira Clifford, which, based on how I know records are structured, I'm going to assume is her maiden name until I can prove otherwise and it lists the divorce date. Now, in this case, it doesn't list an exact date um, because it's done based on months, based on the docket or the calendar of the court, but it does list the location, and then I have a docket number, a court, and a volume and page number. Now, this court happens to be the Supreme Judicial Court in Kennebunk, Maine, and so I could contact that courthouse, either write to them or see if they've got a website, call them, or um, you know, if, if I have family or I live in the area, I could go visit them. I could provide them with this docket number, this volume and page number, and the last name, and they could provide me with the file, the court case, or the court documents, copies of those, um, that would give me information. Now, even if a marriage was never recorded for Stephen and Elmira, they would have had to prove to some degree of certainty to the court that they had actually been married. And so there may be affidavits in that court um, case file that lists, you know, sworn statements from different people who maybe were at their marriage or knew them both before they were married and then knew them after they were married, people who knew that they had lived together for a period of time, right? So all of that are, is going to be information that will lead you either to a marriage record or give you sufficient evidence that a marriage occurred and when and where. So uh, divorce records are a huge, huge um, 
sad event, but huge set of records for us to prove that a marriage occurred. You do, you will have to order those case files, however, from the courthouse. We don't have complete case files for divorce records online. We have indexes. That's what you're going to find. And sometimes those indexes have great information, but there's always more information. Now, this the next set of records I want to talk about briefly is uh, military pension files. So if your ancestor served in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, uh, oftentimes they would apply for a pension because of their military service. Um, also, often a widow would apply for a pension or someone would apply for pension for the underage children. And those widow's pension files are just gold mines of information for a lot of reasons. Um, in order to get a pension, there had to be some proof. There had to be proof of a marriage. There had to be proof that these are really his children. There had to be proof that he really served in the military. Uh, and so all of that information is collected. If the couple had a marriage certificate, or if their marriage was written into a family Bible, or if um, Again, affidavits from people who were at their wedding or who knew, you know, who knew when they got married. They would, you know, swear out statements and, and they would submit those with the pension application so that this widow of this Civil War veteran or this War of 1812 veteran could get that pension. And so these files have some of that information in them. So again, we're going to find those by hovering over search going down to card catalog. I'm actually in the title field again, just to do it quickly, gonna type in the word pension, and you're gonna see we have 27 databases that contain um, uh, indexes to pension records. Now, pension records are um, usually huge files. Sometimes the files are just three or four pages long. I think the largest pension file I personally have ever seen was like 72 pages long. Um, lots of sworn statements and documentation and letters back and forth and whatnot. And so, um, so we haven't digitized all of those millions and millions and millions of images, but the indexes are online here at Ancestry.com. And so you can just come in here to the index, and for example, I could search here for, oh, for Frank Prill. Um, pretty sure he served for Ohio. I'm going to go ahead and just click search with that information, and he should come up right here. Francis M. Prill. Um, his widow is listed as Maggie B. Prill, and then when I click on that view record, it's going to take me to um, this index card. Now, it says view original image. Remember, this is the image of the index that was created to the pension files, and it was created by the National Archives. You can see that down here, the National Archives and Record Administration, or NARA. You can see that down here in the source information. But I want to click on that image because it then gives me additional information. So for example, here I have Francis M. Prill is the name of the soldier. His widow is listed as Maggie B. Prill. He served in G-147 of the Ohio Infantry. He applied for a pension as an invalid uh, on January 2nd, 1890 it looks like. And then his widow applied on August, what is this, August 29th, 1912. So right there, not right here on just the index card, I have a clue to his death. Um, this means he died likely between 1890 and 1912, so there's a, a time period for me. Since they both filed in the state of Ohio, it's likely that he died in Ohio, so that gives me a place to start looking for his death record. However, this application number right here for this widow um, is what I'm going to need in order to order a copy of that original or get my hands on a copy of that original pension file. You can order original pension files directly from the National Archives with that application number. Um, there are some that are available on Fold3, fold3.com. Um, it is an, another company owned by Ancestry.com and if you're not familiar with it, it they have a just a treasure trove of military records and they are working with the National Archives to digitize a lot of those records. So you can check on Fold3 to see if that record has been digitized, and if not, you can order a copy of that directly from the National Archives. 
last set of records I want to talk about, and this is the, I, lo I love newspapers. If you haven't used newspapers in your genealogy research, um, I would strongly encourage you to just explore and see what you can discover. Pick a newspaper from, you know, 1872 and just read through, read through it. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. But um, there are a few things that you need to just be forewarned about. One is that newspaper research is research. Um, it is not just a click of a button and, you know, the miracles happen and things pop up. It does require some patience. It also requires you to be um, a little creative in your searching. However, uh, again, using that card catalog is going to be your best bet just to see what even exists online or what's available. So I'm going to come back over here. Let's go back to my home page. I'm going to hover over search, click on that card catalog. Now this is one case where I am going to use the filters over here on the left because if you've ever paid attention to the titles of newspapers, they're all different and you won't know necessarily what they're called. So I'm just going to click on newspapers and publications over here in my filters and then I'm going to click on newspapers and what you're going to see here is that Ancestry.com has a collection of 1,412 databases that contain newspaper records. I can further filter that. Oh. I can further filter that by location over here on the left. So I can click, for example, on USA. I could scroll down even further and I could or filter even further down by state. I can also filter by time period, either by century or by decade. So I could click on any one of those things in order to filter that list a little bit more. So if I was looking for a marriage in the 1870s um, here in the U.S., I could do that and just see there are 234 um, databases that contain newspaper records for that time period. So I just want to talk about um, one, maybe two, I don't know if we're going to have time, um, of these particular databases. The first one is this one, and I think it just gets overlooked a lot because people aren't exactly sure what it is. This is called the Historical Newspapers, Birth, Marriage, and Death Announcements from 1851 to 2003. That's the name of this database. Um, if you scroll down, you're going to see here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight newspaper titles that are included here. So the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, Chicago Defender, the Hartford Current, Hartford just seems so random in that list, um, the Washington Post from Washington DC, and the Atlanta Constitution. And then just to the right of the name of each of those newspapers, you're going to see the time period that is covered in that particular, um, for that particular location. So for example, the New York Times starts in 1851. The Chicago Tribune starts in 1850. The Hartford Current starts in 1791. That's amazing. And keep in mind, these are just birth, marriage, and death announcements from those newspapers. It's not the entire paper. So you're not searching through articles and advertisements and some of the other things that sometimes inhibit um, or frustrate us about newspaper research. All you are searching are birth, marriage, and death announcements from those newspapers in those time periods. Um, this is actually, it's a clipping service that, that created this database, and so they've actually clipped out those sections or those columns of the newspapers. So I can come in here, for example, I'm not even going to search for a name, I'm just going to put in the year 1851, I'm going to mark that exact, and I'm going to scroll down here and select marriages as my event and mark that exact and click search. I'm not even searching for a name. So there are 250 um, newspaper clippings that contain marriage records for 1851. And I can scroll down this list here and you can see um, one of the things that this database does is a little bit different is that there's no names. Uh, I mean, you can search by name, but when you look at the results, the name doesn't show up. And there are a few reasons for that. Um, one is because each clipping could have dozens of names on it, like dozens of marriage announcements or dozens of death notices or whatever. And so uh, it's just kind of a little quirky thing, but you can click on this little icon over here to view image. Let me do that this way so that I don't lose my search results. And then you'll see what the clipping is. So in this case, it's just one little clip. You'll notice that this isn't the greatest quality of image. Well, that's because it's a really, really old newspaper um, that has been digitized. But here's a marriage notice um, on that date. What was that date? 
18th of September, 1851, out of the New York Times. And it says in Trinity Church, Fredonia, on the 15th. I, I can't even read that, right? But I would, I probably could if I spent some more time with it. By Reverend T.P. Tyler, John M. Grant Esquire of Jamestown to Sarah, daughter of Honorable James Mullet of Fredonia. So here you get the marriage date. You get who performed the marriage, which gives you clues to their um, religious affiliation and where they may have had children baptized, where they may have been buried. In this case, you also get the location, the residence of the bride and the groom and the, the not just the maiden name of the uh, bride, but her father's name as well. So this particular database, uh, I, I would encourage you to just spend some time with it. Um, if your family was from any of those areas. Now you'll notice this was the New York Times um, and this person lived in, or the bride was from Fredonia and the groom was from Jamestown. Neither of them were from what we would traditionally consider New York City and yet their marriage was still included. And in this case, I mean obviously right, John Grant Esquire and the Honorable James Mullet, um, they seem like they may have been a little bit more prominent in the community, but that is not always the case. I have found marriages for people who were, you know, nowhere near, um, and, you know, I mean, who lived in tenements and who had just immigrated to this country and whatever, and yet there's, their marriage records are still recorded in the newspaper um, for whatever reason. So sometimes you have to get a little creative in searching. Like you'll notice here, I just searched for marriages in 1851. I could narrow that down further by, you know, I only wanna see what was in the New York Times and mark that exact. And, you know, if I know that they got married in the, you know, the month of September or October, I could put that in the keyword field and narrow that down even further. And here, now I only have 59 search results and I haven't even put in a name yet. So that gives me some interesting and creative ways to search. Remember that newspaper records are OCR'd, which means a computer reads the page and does the indexing. And so, you know, if the quality of that record is like some of these where you know, it's a little bit more difficult to read, uh, then the computer may have gotten it wrong. Or in this case where it looks like, you know, I, you know, like you can see the little crossbar on that H has faded, and so the computer might not read that exactly correct. In this case, they actually hyphenated or um, broke Mary's name, Mary, right, on two separate lines. A computer's not gonna be able to read Mary as one name. So if you were to search for Mary Mills, this record probably wouldn't come up. But if you were to search for John, or if you were to search by this time or date, right? That's what I mean by you have to be creative about how to search because newspapers were recorded. They recorded information kind of funny based on how we might do it today. And uh, depending on how faded or how much noise, that's what we call, you know, you can see kind of some of these dots on the page that happen on a lot of newspapers, how much visual noise there is on the page. When the computer reads it, sometimes it gets stuff not always accurate. Anyway, so um, newspapers are a great, great, great resource, but you do have to be patient and you do have to be a little bit creative when you search them. But I have, I have confidence in you. I have had success with that. I'm sure you will as well if you just take the time to learn a little bit more about how to do that. Well, that is all we have time for today. Um, I hope this was helpful. As always, if you're watching this live, I will be available on chat in just a few minutes. If you're watching this um, archived on our YouTube channel, you can uh, leave a comment. We do monitor those and respond respond as necessary. Our uh, May calendar of events will be going up on our Facebook events page in the next couple of days, so keep an eye out for that so that you can RSVP for those events in May that are of interest to you. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.